Welcome to Peace Arvada YouTube. We hope you enjoy this message. Um, before I begin, I, I encourage you to get out this outline. Um, it's, it's about marriage today. Uh, I'm not going to be pulling any punches about that at all. Um, and, and part of the reason, I, I was going to preach on something that's a, a predominant problem in our culture today. Um, when I determined three or four weeks ago what I was going to preach about today, but I changed my mind this week. Um, you're going to hear the message I was going to preach somewhere down the road, but I knew that we'd have a, a good number of folks kind of coming back to church today kind of a, as a New Year resolution, and many of those folks are married, so I thought, you know what? I haven't preached on marriage for quite a while, and I'm going to talk about it today. And uh, the text is really a good one. It's Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we come before you today knowing indeed that we fall short of your glory fall short of your standard. We're not what you have made us to be, God. You made us to be in Adam and Eve, perfect and holy and sinless. And as a result of their sin, we're born in sin, God. And so many times that sin manifests itself in marriage. Oh, God, help us to be renewed and strengthened, revitalized and forgiven today through the proclamation of this word. And help us to realize that we dedicate ourselves in marriage to you, God, as we try to be amazing husbands, amazing wives, yet fallible, error-prone, sinful, but amazing because you make us that way through the power of your Spirit. In the precious name of you, Lord Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. First thing I want to say this morning is nobody has a perfect marriage. Nobody has a perfect marriage. Adam and Eve did for a while. They never fought. They never argued. They never debated. Their relationship was perfect. Their relationship with God was perfect. But then something happened, they fell into sin, and as a result of that, we are all born sinful. And as a result of that sin, it manifests itself many times in marriage, creating conflict, disillusionment, disrespect, and the like, right? How many of you can say that, no show of hands, about your marriage? It's sometimes you get in conflicts, sometimes you don't get along all the time real well, and as a result of that, you sometimes have this angst about your condition and your relationship with God. Um, no show of hands, but many of you feel that way. I want to share with you good news. Pastor Tim said it at the beginning of the sermon, I say it to you now. You are loved by God. Despite your shortcomings, sins, weaknesses, faults, transgressions, all of it separated us from God. But as a result of what Jesus has done, Jesus tore down our sin, carried our sin, and made us one with God, reconciled us to God, and brought us new life in Him, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. All of us who trust in Jesus, who repent of our sin and trust in Jesus, believe that. And we want Jesus Christ to make our marriages, if you're married, great today. Amen? And the only thing that motivates us to want to dedicate our lives to Christ in marriage is the gospel. The good news of God's love for us in Christ. The fact that we had sinned against God and broken his commands, and yet God in his magnificent mercy and grace and astounding love has sent his son Jesus to live, die, and to rise again to give us new life in his name. Now, here's the deal. Because of that, we want to dedicate ourselves to God in marriage and make our marriages as good as they can be. Amen? So, so I'm asking a real fundamental question today because there's a lot of negative press about marriages today. A lot of people are delaying marriage today. Uh, marriage is kind of taking a hit. A lot of people disrespect it, say demeaning things about it. It's being redefined today, marriage is. And as a result of that, there's a lot of conflict regarding what is marriage. Is it, is it something between a man and a woman or something else? Yes, marriage is being redefined. A lot of people have problems in life, and they hope that when they get married, that'll kind of fix their problems, right? A lot of people, maybe you're one of those, hey, I have a lot of problems in my life, but if I get married, everything is going to be solved. All my problems are going to be taken away. Marriage does not solve problems or take them away. Marriage reveals problems, right? All of us know that. 
I mean, if you're grumpy before marriage, marriage reveals how grumpy you really can be. If you struggle with worry and fear, marriage reveals that worry and fear. If you struggle with depression before you're married, marriage reveals that depression. If you struggle with um, being kind of a grouch, Mary reveals just how grouchy you can be. Marriage does not resolve problems. Marriage does not take problems away. It reveals problems. So all that being said, we need a mandate from God helping us to understand how to deal with all that in marriage and what is the purpose of marriage. And for us to understand that, we look at this powerful text found in the book of Genesis chapter 2, beginning to read at the 18th verse. And Cheryl, could you advance these for us as I go through this? Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now, what are we talking about? God had planted Adam in this garden. And all these animals, one by one, came to Adam and he named it all. He named every one of them. That was his prerogative. That was his authority. God gave him that responsibility. And so all these animals, the giraffe, the monkey, the hippopotamus, the rhinoceros, all the birds, all of, he named them all. They all came to him. And it's not like God looked at all that and said, hmm, oh boy, what am I going to do? None of these fit the bill for him. God knew all along what he was going to do. Adam's responsibility was to name the animals, and that's exactly what he did. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. In other words, all these animals aren't going to meet his needs. They're nice. They're cute. They're cuddly, some of them. But they're not going to meet his needs. Verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Isn't that cool? God gave Adam the authority to name all these animals, okay? And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name, okay? Verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. In other words, God said, I want to make someone who's a lot like you, but just a little different, that complements you in every way, that meets your needs that satisfies your desires, but also you will meet her needs and satisfy her desires. I want you to have a close companion, a friend for life, and not just for life, but for eternity. By the way, God's direction was that this marriage that he was establishing with Adam and Eve would go on into eternity, that they would never have death enter the picture. But the Bible says that because they ate of the fruit, their eyes were open, they knew good from evil, their eyes were open, and they died. And as a result of that, everyone has been dying ever since then. So God's original desire was they would have the perfect marriage. And for a time, until they ate of the fruit, they did have a perfect marriage. So God recognizes Adam is alone. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. This is the first indication of anesthesia, guys, okay? Causes him to fall into a deep sleep. Why? Because it hurts to have a rib projecting from your side and taken out. So he causes him to fall into a deep sleep, a very deep sleep. The anesthesia has been given. He takes this rib from his side amazingly, from his side, and he molds and fashions this marvelous creation by the name of Eve. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, I I want you to think about, there's a lot of different things that have been written about why this rib was taken from his side. Why God didn't just make her out of clay like he did with Adam? Because he wanted this individual, this is one of the reasons, he wanted this individual by the name of Eve to be very close to Adam. And Adam, very close to Eve. Can't get any closer than taking somebody's rib out. Right? He was giving a picture, really, of how close, intimately connected, he wanted these two people to be. And they were. And when Adam saw what God had made, he said, whoo-wee, man, 
that does not look like a dragon. That does not look like a rhino. Let, let's go on. Okay, so, so God does this. He creates this mold, molds this beautiful, incredible, gorgeous creature by the name of Eve. And immediately, Adam's eyes are wide open, and he's saying, holy cow. This is so good. So, so look at verse 25, okay? Oh, verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to the man. Okay, can you imagine that? And by the way, I believe that God was pretty satisfied with what he had made in Eve. So he molds and fashions this marvelous individual by the name of Eve, and he says, come along. Adam, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. Take a look. There you go. Yeah, wow, that's right, huh? <laughs> okay. Now, now notice this is a, this is, notice what he says here in verse 23. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Paraphrase, Dave's paraphrase. You know what Adam was saying? You got it, God. You, you nailed it. She looks good. That's what I'm talking about. That's someone who's like me, but just a little bit different. And I love it. He was able to give her her name. Think about that. He gave all these animals all their names, and now he gets to name this individual, this precious woman, and he calls her woman because it's a derivative of the word man. She was taken from his side to be by his side. He calls her woman. Now, I love verse 24. This is really, really good. Who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, by the way, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. A guy by the name of Moses did. And so Moses adds, adds his own commentary here in verse 24. Go ahead and look at it. Because, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife. I know that's true. A daughter is a daughter all your life, but a son is a son until he takes a wife. How many of you know, show of hands, that have sons, know that's true. You know what they're doing? They're doing what's biblical. Here it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. In other words, he doesn't not cherish them. He doesn't love them. He doesn't care for them. But now his focus is on his wife. Now his attention is given to her. Now his number one priority, besides glorifying God, is to honor and serve and care for and nurture her. I love it. So if any of you have sons or son-in-laws that seem so much more attached to their wives than you, good. It's the way it ought to be. So many times we get so selfish. Oh, I wish they'd call me more. Well, they, they're supposed to be focused on raising their family, loving their wives. It's good. It's right. It's biblical. Okay? Okay. Now, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And then look at this, and they shall become one flesh. I love that. So think about this. At the moment that Eve was made, God took this rib from Adam's side and fashioned and molded this marvelous creature by the name of Eve. Now there's separation. Now they're two distinct individuals. But God wanted them still to consider themselves to be at one. And so he incredibly, magnificently created this marvelous thing called the sexual union to bring them back together. They were divided when the rib was separated from Adam. Now they're brought back together through the sexual union. And I love what the Scripture says, they're one flesh. Isn't that a great way to put it? I want to tell you, marriage is God's idea, and so is sex. And that's good, within the confines of marriage. I won't ask for an amen there, but you know what I'm saying, okay? Yeah, God, it's good. It's the way God intended it to be. So all of this, you're probably thinking, well, why did you walk us through this today, Pastor Dave? What's this all about? To answer the simple fundamental question. And the simple fundamental question is, what is the primary purpose of marriage? Here it is. Primary purpose of marriage is companionship. That you ought to look at your husband and wife and say, this individual is my best friend. And if this person that you made a lifelong commitment to is not your best friend, 
You need to make him or her that, okay? And you're probably thinking, well, how do I do that? How do I make my husband or my wife my best friend? Here's the first way. Make your home a shelter from the storms of life. How many of you get roughed up out there in the real world every once in a while? Raise your hand. You get roughed up in the real world, your boss lets you down, or somebody at work that frustrates you, or at school this kid makes fun of you, or you lose the game or whatever. It's tough out there, right? It is rough living out there in the real world. And do we not want to come home when we get inside the home to say to one another, ah. You know, three or four times a week, I go in my hot tub, and I, I, I like my hot tub because I'm old, and, and, you know, my stuff starts to ache, and I get in the hot tub, and I go, uh, you ought to be able to say the same thing when you come home. You're in that fortress. You're in that shelter. You're away from the storms of life. You know that when you come through the door of your home that there's going to be people there that will love you unconditionally, that won't try to mold and shape you into something that other people want you to be, that will accept your foibles and faults and shortcomings and weaknesses and cover you with grace. That's what it means to have a shelter. Is your home a shelter? Is it a place that you can't wait to go home to? And if it's not, make it that way. Have a heart-to-heart talk with your husband or wife and say, what can we do to make this home a shelter from the storms of life? Let's eliminate criticism, rejection, rebuke, unjustified comments. Now, some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Pastor Dave, you've told us before that in marriage we ought to hold one another accountable. Absolutely. But you do it with love and grace and dignity and sensitivity. And that's not easy. Sometimes my wife has to tell me stuff that I'm doing wrong and I don't like to hear it, but I want her to say it because I want to become more like Jesus. How many of you want to become more like Jesus? Raise your hand. Absolutely. We need someone to hold us accountable. But generally speaking, when you come home, you ought to be able to say, the people in this home, my wife, my husband, love me just the way I am. And I want to go home to them because I'm safe there. I can walk in the door of that home and go, ah. How many ah moments have you had lately? So make your home a shelter. Secondly, resolve conflict before you go to bed. You know a lot of people don't do that. They go to bed angry. They sleep in separate rooms. They hope that somehow this big issue that they're dealing with will somehow disappear. And so they figuratively put it under the rug. They don't deal with it the next morning. The angst has dissipated to a certain extent, but they're still angry, and you can tell. And so a wedge has been created, and that wedge gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as they don't deal with the issues at hand. They hope that somehow they'll resolve themselves, somehow they'll go away, and pretty soon there's this huge wedge, this huge partition, this huge wall between husband and wife, and they don't know how to break through. Here's the resolute answer to that. Work out stuff when it comes. Don't go to bed angry at one another. Ephesians 4 says, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Resolve the conflict before you go to bed and go to bed at peace and let go of that past conflict. Let it go. Don't be historical. Don't bring it up in the middle of an argument months later, something that you covered them with grace for, something you forgave them for, and all of a sudden you bring it up in the middle of an argument months later, and you say, wait a minute, I thought you forgave me for that. I did, but no, no. The movie Frozen says, let it go, right? Let it, let it. You ever had to say that to your husband? Would you just let it go? God, it's hard to do. 
What did I start this message with? The grace of God. It's only the grace of God, the unconditional love of God in Christ Jesus that moves and impels and motivates us to carry this out effectively in marriage. And we still trip and stumble and fall. What's the third thing that you can do to make your husband or wife your best friend? Date each other consistently. Now that's, is that biblical, Pastor Dave? Well, not really. But man, it's important. You know, so many men and women, they look at marriage like they're going shopping. Find it, bag it, and bring it home. Right? Isn't that right? Or hunting. I got the catch, and we did the, the stuff we needed to do, now it's in the fridge. Now I move on. Hey, a lot of people look at marriage that way. They have all this fun. They're doing all this exciting stuff. They're going out to eat. They're going to movies. And now they say, I do. And oh, it's really boring. Now their relationship is really boring. And they don't date each other anymore. They do, don't do fun and exciting things anymore. They take it for granted each other. I mean, they're, they're in this cycle of, you know, get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed. Next morning, Get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed. You know what we need? Spice. I, I, I love going out on a date with my wife. And our two favorite things to do is, number one, go out to eat. Number two, go to movies. Love it. Love it. It's something different. It makes me appreciate her more. It's out of the ordinary. It brings spice to the relationship. Don't quit dating each other, even if you've been married 40, 50, maybe 60 years. And yes, put it in your budget. Well, Pastor Dave, that's really expensive. We got to get a babysitter and we got to do all this stuff. Put it in your budget. And husbands, I'm looking to you. You got to lead. Don't leave it up to your wife because they get mad when we say, well, you, you figure it out. You, 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 you decide. No, 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 no. Are we, who's the leader of the home? Husbands or wives? According to Scripture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not according to culture, okay? According to Scripture, who's the leader of the home? Guys are. Lead! Guys, lead! Get out your iPhone. Look at what restaurant you want to go to. See what movie is out there that's good and godly. And Go! Date each other. That avoids taking each other for granted. And finally, how does your spouse become your best friend? Have devotions and pray together. This is a, obviously, this is a common sense one. <clears throat> well, of course, you have devotions and you pray together. If you're not doing that, I'm not here to throw cold water on you and to make you feel bad and to make you feel guilty. I'm not saying that at all. But you got to do it. You designate a time, you say this is when we're going to do it, you find a devotional book, whether it's portals of prayer, whatever it is, and you do it, and then you pray together. And again, this is where I'm looking at you men to lead. You lead the family in prayer. And you might be saying, well, I don't like to pray out loud. Well, try it. Start. I love the way the disciples said, how do you pray? And Jesus said, you start by saying, our Father. That's a good place to start. And you pour out your heart to God. And you talk to God, Martin Luther said, like you would your own dear dad. I want to tell you, none of my kids growing up, none of them came to me and said, dear omnipotent, omnipresent, omnowing, all-powerful dad. No, they didn't say any of that stuff. What did they say? They said, dad, this is what we need. Dad, what's going on? Dad, can you help me with this? It's the same thing in your prayer life. God, this is what's going on. And you don't have to sound like us. As a matter of fact, it's better that you don't. And you trip and stumble over your words, that's okay. God is not standing up there saying, man, oh man, can't you do better than that? No. He loves you, man. You're his child. Can you, when, you, when your kids come to you and they have a big request and tears are running down their cheeks and they say, daddy, daddy, please listen to me. You drop everything. You say, yeah, wh what's going on? Tell me. And sometimes as a dad or a mom, you might even reach down and you might pick them up and you might... Do one of these. God's the same way. Just talk to him like you would your own dear dad. So this is how to make your marriage great. This is biblical stuff to make your marriage strong. The primary reason God created marriage was for companionship. 
Make your home a shelter. Resolve conflicts before you go to bed. Talk to him in devotion and prayer. Do all these things that God has entrusted us to do. Don't go to bed angry. And let Jesus Christ remain preeminent. In conclusion, I want to tell you this. As a couple, live under the gospel. What does that mean, as a couple, live under the gospel? How many of you have a perfect marriage? Raise your hand. How many of you mess up and irritate one another? Raise your hand. Okay, every one of you do, okay? Here's what you do. First of all, you go to God with that. God, I said stuff I shouldn't have said. I did stuff I shouldn't have done to my wife or husband, and I'm sorry, and I repent of that. And then you think about and contemplate the fact that God loves you unconditionally for the sake of his son. That was that sin that allowed Jesus to go to the cross and visualize God saying to you, you're still my son, you're still my daughter, you belong to me, my son paid the price, my spirit lives within you, look at your wife, look at your husband as your best friend, and let the gospel, unconditional love and forgiveness permeate. Now, God has given us love and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. We dispense and distribute that to people in our family. As God has covered us with grace, we cover others with grace. As God has covered us with forgiveness, we cover others with forgiveness. Let the gospel predominate. We're under God's love and forgiveness and grace. Let that permeate your home. Amen? Let that permeate your home. Thank you for joining us. If you're ever in the Arvada area, we would love to welcome you in person. We have services at 8 and 1030.